So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, August the 27th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 123. Now I know a lot of the United States and other parts of the world are scorching hot right now. Here in Pennsylvania, we're at 89 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 32 degrees Celsius. So I'm glad you're here. If you're brand new, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. If you want to submit a question, please write it in the comment section down below. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today in this video, please look in the video description. And there'll also be valuable links down there. It's also a podcast. So if you're joining us via podcast, I'm glad you're out there listening, commuting, driving. And thank you to those of you who wrote me about how valuable the podcast is to you while you make your commutes on Fridays and Saturdays. Thanks for being here. So this is the way to be. And you can find out more at thewaytobe.org. So let's get started today. We're going to start right off with, I don't know how to say the first name probably, V-A-L-A-S, so Valis Homan. Do you have or have you used Formic Pro on your hives? I used it and two out of five hives lost their queen. One colony built about 30 supersedure cells with multiple queens hatched out. I'm not really worried about that one. The other hive was the exact opposite of the first hive. For some reason, they made zero queen cells. I went through the hive twice. There was no young brood and only a couple of frames of cap brood in the two brood boxes. I was wondering if you have seen anything like this happen before. And I know the queen was in there before treatment. What would be your theory on why no queen cells? Okay, well, first of all, the good news is you've got a hive that's full of queen cells, whole pile of them. In fact, 30 supersedure cells with multiple queens hatched out. So if any of those supersedure cells are still there unhatched out, I would pull those frames and put them in the one that lost their queen so that we can get that replaced right away. But what this does for me is gives me an opportunity to talk to people about something that's happening a lot with uh, even our local beekeepers here when they're using Formic Pro. And Formic Pro is what I have on the shelf here. I haven't used it yet this year because luckily my mite counts have been low enough through integrated pest management practices that I haven't had to use it, but it could happen because we're in a time of rapid increase right now. But um, what could be happening because I want to talk about Formic Pro. A lot of people apparently don't read all of the instructions. I mean, they know that it can be used with Honey Super Zon, which is valuable because right now, all our colonies here, we're in a big nectar flow, they're taking on weight. Huge amounts of weight every single day. And I got into one hive and was inspecting it and the lightest little shake of the frame and all the nectar just flies out everywhere. So their cells are full, they need twice the space to make honey, you know, when the nectar is not ripe it occupies twice the real estate inside your hive that it will ultimately when it's dehydrated down one of the reasons i bring that out is because one of the things that you have to make sure before you treat formic pro number one how big is the hive that you're putting it on how many bees you have to have and this is according to the manufacturer of formic pro you need a minimum of 10,000 bees in your hive before you use it so it's only for strong colonies this is not for nucleus colonies small startup colonies and things like that. The information that I'm putting out here right now is for everyone, not just the person posting the question. So that's about nine full frames, full deep frames of bees. So if it's smaller than that, Formic may not be what you want to use. The other thing is you have to fully open the entrance when you're using it. Half inch height, full width, no restrictions, no mouse guards, no entrance reducers of any kind, because during that critical first three days when you put your formic in there, they're going to need to be able to get out and they need to ventilate. The other thing which seems weird is that you're not supposed to have your screen bottom boards open. So those need to be closed off also. So if you've got a core flute insert or something like that, that needs to be in there. Close off that bottom screen board during formic because now it actually vents off too well and makes the formic less effective. The first three days are super critical. So the other thing, and this is why this comes to mind right now, because a lot of people that I know have reported queen losses, dead bees, damaged brood, while using Formic Pro. And you would think that that wouldn't happen, but I look back on the temperatures that we've had, and I can't think that we're adhering to the temperature restrictions, right? 
So write in the instructions, 50 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, that's day and night. So it shouldn't be lower than 50 overnight, that just makes it less effective. Higher than 85 is when you start to see losses. So they found out the critical temperature was anything equal to or greater than 92 degrees Fahrenheit for those first three days. Even the manufacturer says you would have excessive B, brood, and queen loss. And that's what's being described here. So my, I'm curious about the temperature parameters during this treatment period. And you can treat in a single treatment cycle or you can do two. One pad, one after another, or you can do two pads together and treat in a single cycle. So, but when you've got two pads in there, make sure to follow all the instructions and separate those pads and they sit on the back frames of your uh, brood frames. And the first three days, again, are critical. That's when you're going to have maximum dosing in there. But they found those that reported that I know found that there was less of a die-off when they did the single treatments one after another. So you have the option for both. But follow all those instructions. The other thing is you should not be feeding inside the hive during that time. Another thing, the hive has to have lots of food and resources already stored up before you start treatment. All of these things help your bees survive a treatment that is designed to kill off the Varroa destructor mites, not your bees. And then you talk to some commercial people who say, yeah, don't care. I just put in the formic on all of them. I'm requeening anyway. So I kill all the mites. I take my losses when it comes to bees and brood. And then I install new queens after the treatment has been completed. So for you who are backyard beekeepers, and you're my target audience, you're my target group that I'm informing. So I want you to adhere to those temperatures and uh, all the parameters that are established by those who sell Formic Pro. So pay attention to it. Hopefully there is a heat wave all over the country and other parts of the world too. Pay attention to the entire period of treatment, but the most critical time, of course, the first 72 hours. So I hope that helps that. And some of you who are thinking about using that treatment, make sure you meet the parameters and you can go for it. Next one comes from Andrew Mallard. When entering your hive, are there any occasions you wouldn't smoke or spray with syrup? While syrup spray may not seem, may not set them back, please comment if you feel differently. I've been told smoking can set your hive back a few days. We've had some really bad weather this summer, southeast England, and so whenever undertaking simple tasks, I've not smoked because I don't want to set them back during a period when the weather is already doing a job of this. Do you think the colony is disrupted more by not smoking, spraying, or do you feel this is a good practice? My bees are definitely quicker in defending when not smoking, but also I'm in and out pretty quickly, not during inspections for which I would smoke. I'm hoping this is a less disruptive process. Worse perhaps, could this have a detrimental impact on behavior leading to defensive traits? Thank you for your weekly presentations. Well, thank you and thanks for commenting. So here's the thing. And no, I don't always smoke when I go into my hives because I, it depends, as described here, on what is it you're going to do. Are you going to pull brood frames and stuff? Are you going to get in there and really break things apart to find out what's going on? Before you go into your hives, always have a plan. What do you need to see? Why are you getting in there? Don't just do it for kicks and giggles because you just want to check in on your bees, see what's going on. There are a lot of people who never use smoke and never use syrup. They just open their hives. And they treat them like mercury-fused bombs. They open them up. They're very careful. They don't bump anything, you know, and the bees don't flip out on them. But of course, bee temperament changes throughout the year, throughout the seasons with what's going on. So you can get away with a lot of stuff. Right now, for example, we have nectar flow on. And because all the colonies in my apiary, right now there are 20 of them, I know. So all hives in the apiary are bringing in their own resources. They're too busy being fat and happy with all the stuff they have going on. And you can very carefully pull the hive cover, pull the inner cover, and work your way through the hive without any response from the bees. One thing I caution is that you should have your smoker ready to go. Maybe even light it and set it off to the side. Because as to the question here, is it more detrimental not to use smoke and to get in there and then if they get a little heated, close them up? Is that more upsetting than smoking the hive? Now, smoking the hive uh, puts bees off of honey production. 
Now the question comes in, and I've asked this question among my peers and uh, people that do a lot of research. Where does it come from that we're talking about smoke impacting the hive? First of all, we know that smoke interrupts the alarm pheromone, that's why we use it. But it also causes the bees to consume their own honey resources, which pacifies them and uh, occupies them. And, uh, but because they think there's some kind of fire around, they stop honey production. Why would they continue to invest in the infrastructure and stores resources if they think that things could be ending soon? So they're just consuming all their favorite foods right now and seeking deep shelter. So they are alarmed, even though they did not put on alarm pheromone because that's what the smoke stopped them from doing. And it kept them from attacking the beekeeper and of course dying in the process. All those that deliver stings to the gloves, the suit, the skin of the beekeeper, they all die. So it is less impactful on the bees if you can sneak in there without any smoke. Now the, the in-between and something that I used a lot last year in particular, this year as hot as things are, one to one sugar syrup with two teaspoons of Honey Bee Healthy mixed in per quart. And that stuff has a long shelf life. I used to have my leather holder for it hanging back here behind me and it's out actually in my bee stock room there uh, because I carry it with me wherever I go. And if I'm going to get into a bunch of hives, right now the hives do not care uh, like the hives. The colonies, the bees themselves, don't care if you're opening up a colony, a little bit of honey scent goes into the air. Because right now you go anywhere near the apiary and the scent of honey is heavy in the air everywhere. So they're not going to get as much attention where, let's say I did this late September, I have to watch out for releasing the smell of honey into the air, and then I've got foraging bees from other colonies, and I've got a robbing situation, and then the bees get defensive when they're being robbed. So now there's this big fight going on, and then the others come in, even when you button it up, now the landing board's getting attacked, and so it goes. So smoking at that time of year would be valuable. This time of year, I can get away with sugar syrup with Honey Bee Healthy or any essential oil in it, by the way. Um, whatever your favorite is, that's for your bees. Because there's Pro Health, there's Beekeeper's Choice, there are several types out there. So, but like, I just need to look in to see if the feeders are good, or look in to see if uh, I want to pull under the inner cover and see if that box is full and I might need to super. I would do that without a smoker. I'm going to check out the landing board first. No guard bees paying attention to me, they all seem pretty passive. Do it midday when most of your foragers are out. So from noon to 2.33 in the afternoon would be a great time to be popping that inner cover. And then have your other equipment ready to go. And then don't bang and bump and slam things around. Slow, steady, methodical, no vibrations, all the things that inspire your bees to get alerted. Make sure that those elements are not there. So. And as far as, you know, like I said, when I asked people about the smoke, I mean, because it was in the literature that you could interrupt bees' um, honey production for up to 24 hours. When I asked everybody where that came from, uh, nobody gave me a response. I got no data to back that up. So one thing's for sure, smoking the hives. And the other thing is minimal smoke. When you see some people think that if a little smoke is great, a lot of smoke is better. So I say have your smoker lit. The other thing is what kind of fuel do you have in there that doesn't scare the bees or get them alarmed. Uh, and the other thing is, um, so pine needles, the really nice long dried out pine needles seem to have a less alarming effect on the bees. So there's that. The other thing is uh, make sure that you've got the kind of smoker that has a spark arrestor in that top cone. Most of them don't have that. So look for that. If they don't have one, you might consider fabricating something like that because some people, when they really try to puff it to really get it going, like they think it's gone out and they're just working the bellows really hard, you see these little sparks fly out. Well, if you're doing that, pointing it at your hive because you've got a couple guard bees that are giving you some stress and you really do that and some sparks fly in there, now you've really annoyed your bees. So get it worked up so it's smoking away from the hive, then turn it, light puffs, Whatever you need to get any bees that are staring at you instead of doing their own business, if they're not binding their own business inside the hive, and they pause, they look up at you, you give them a little puff, and they don't turn away and go back down or go about their business, 
then a little more puff. But as soon as they turn away, lightest puff. As soon as they turn away, that's the end of the smoke. Don't over smoke. Smoke yourself all you want. There again, occupational exposure to bee smokers, I think, has to be bad for people. We're backyard beekeepers. Thank goodness we're not exposed to it every day, all day. So you can look in, do minimal, minimally invasive investigations in your beehives without smoke. Have it ready. The less you use, the better off the bees are. Good idea. And during other periods, if you're going to use the sugar syrup method, which I've had really good results with, some people disagree with me, and that's okay. Um, I spritz other hives. So if they're, if I think they might get attention from other hives, if they're already being pinged and there's guard bees and things like that, that are, or foragers that are testing other hives later in the season, spritz all their landing boards and get them all occupied. It's cheap, easy to go, and it doesn't stop them from their valuable honey production and work inside the hive. Next question number three is from Alan Blair, Chatsworth, Georgia. If super seizure cells are created to replace a queen the bees have deemed unfit, then why do so many beekeepers destroy them? Don't the bees know best? Well, so here's the thing. If we're looking at a frame, because if you are unfamiliar, super seizure cells are queen cells that the bees are making to supersede the existing queen. They don't like her for some reason. Maybe she's old. She's not laying enough eggs. She doesn't have a good brood pattern. Maybe she's injured. Maybe somebody put paint all over her when they were trying to mark her thorax. Any number of things, and even things that we don't comprehend, could be judged by the bees to make her unfit. So what they start doing is they're trying to get rid of her, but let's say that she's ended her fertility state. Let's say that somebody just went nuts with their Formic Pro that we were talking about earlier, and the queen's fertility was impacted. Now, they don't get the time to make a normal swarm cell. Let's say this is your brood frame here. And in the middle, you see a little peanut shaped like planter's peanuts with the shell still on them coming off the center somewhere in here. And they come out and then they droop down and run parallel with this. That is a super seizure cell, something they made as an emergency. In other words, they had to make use of eggs that are already there, and they're only eggs for three days, or eggs that have just recently hatched. Like yesterday it was an egg, today it's a larva. So sometimes they take that and they turn it into a queen. Now what's already happened there? So if they're superseding because the queen has lost her ability to lay eggs and they're using a hatched larva, then they're already a little behind, plus they had to pick and deal with what was already available. They don't get to start to make queen cups, which are along the edges, sometimes on the end over here, usually along the bottom. They make a queen cup first, even before they need it. It's kind of like just making extra space, you know, just in case, so they don't have to manufacture it all at once. And then the queen comes along while she's still healthy, and she deposits her egg in one of the queen cups, and then that little egg, when it hatches, gets the full attention of all the bees, and they're going to take care of it, and it's in an oversized cell. What size cell did it start out with up here in a supersedure situation? A normal worker cell. So a little tiny normal worker cell in there, and they picked an egg that was designed to be a worker, not laid by the queen to be a queen. Probably no difference genetically. But anyway, they get a bigger cell, a better fed uh, queen, in the swarm cells down here, not in the supersedure cells. Because the other thing is they're doing this and they're picking one of these at a time when the queen is in decline. So she's also not producing her best fertile eggs. See, she's loaded with eggs and she produces eggs after she's made it. And this can go on for years, right? So when it gets to the end and she starts to produce fewer fertile eggs or the eggs that she's producing are not viable, then we have a problem because that's what they're going to be making the replacement queen out of. We would much rather, when she's in her prime, when she's ready to take off and start another colony of bees somewhere, that's when we want to get her eggs into these queen cells, and that is dictated by the workers. The queen doesn't make those queen cells. The workers do, and they're already planning to start scooting her around and get her kicked out to carry on somewhere else, and a swarm goes with her. So those would be healthier. So, but the people who are cutting them out or squishing those supersedure cells should be careful because if the queen is failing, 
she may not be able to reproduce. And if you don't have other resources, other colonies or other hives to go ahead and get those resources from, you could be in a pickle if you're a backyard beekeeper with one colony of bees. You're going to want that to proceed your cell. But let's say it's me. So I'm sitting here and there's a super seizure cell and I see no brood anywhere as described by our other poster here which was talking about the forming. I have resource hives that I can go to and look at fresh laid eggs and I can put those in the colony because those eggs are being produced by a super healthy productive queen that's not being rejected by her workers. So even though those would be also emergency cells later, uh, they would come from a queen that's still in her prime. So I hope that makes sense too. So if you've got more than one colony, you have the option to swap out and put in brand new eggs laid by your queen. Those are the best because then your bees can pick which egg they want to attend to. And then there's a whole bunch of them. So now the workers can decide after they've hatched and release that little pheromone that stimulates the nurse bees to start to feed them. Then they'll pick the larvae that they want to create their supersedure cells from that field there. So that'll look like a super seizure cell too, but it will have come from a queen that's still in her prime. Just many options to do the same thing. But it's up to you. You have to evaluate the colony as a whole and see what's going on and why the queen is failing. And if you still see a super seizure cell like that, but in all other respects, that colony is fantastic. Plenty of uh, larvae in there, plenty of eggs, they're at all stages. The patterns are good. There's not a bunch of empty spots and everything else looks good. Then I think you're okay to wipe out that supersedure cell if you want to. Now the flip side, if they swarm out and you've done that and they don't have those resources, then you're in a pickle. So hope that answers that question. Question number four. Ba -do -ba -do. Coastal Buzz, regarding the bee scanning app, what did your follow-up mite test numbers show compared to the bee scanning analysis with the low count? So the bee scanning app is an app for your phone and you take pictures of your brood frames and then they give you a count of the mites on there. And I've said in the past that uh, you can use that to determine if you need to treat. For example, it actually tells you this colony requires intervention when you have a high mite load on the brood frames. And this thing takes pictures, but remember, as I said before, uh, the bee scanning app is very good at finding phoretic mites that are on the backs of the bees. But also, guess where the mites are feeding? They're on the abdomen of the bee, on the underside, in between those plates. And they can't be seen easily. Even when beekeepers look at them, your bees are not flipping their underside to you, so you can't really look for mites. And they're tucked up under there and the varroa destructor mite is contoured like the abdomen of the bee. So it slips right in there and only a little bit of it is showing. So since the bee scanning app doesn't show the underside of the bees, I have said if it takes a picture and says it's clear, you're not necessarily clear. On the flip side, if it takes a picture and says that you're loaded and you need treatment, don't bother doing a sugar shake or an alcohol wash or a soap water, you know, wash, whatever you're doing. Um, Go ahead and treat. If they're low, you still have to do those things. So then the question here is, so they're low. Let's say it only picked up a couple of mites. Every hive has mites. It just depends on how many of the mites are in there. So then how different was it? There is a correlation, but see, I'm a backyard beekeeper. I can't come up with the statistics on that. But probably if we had a real reliable consensus that we set up a procedure for exactly what people are doing when they're counting and everything else, if you got two mites on your bee scanning app for the whole frame or for the whole hive, let's say, two mites. But then you did, you went to the brood frame and you did your 300 bee collection and then you washed it. So use your soap or your alcohol wash and then you counted the mites that came out and you ended up with, let's say, nine mites that's a treatment threshold for 300 bees because that's three percent so if you had nine mites in there even though it showed two now as we begin to document all of our hives does that start to be consistent so in other words when the bee scanning app shows two do we consistently find nine or when it shows one do we consistently find you know five in there so we need more record keeping, more data comparisons to see that by the time the mites are phoretic, by the time they're showing themselves on the backs of bees, does it also indicate um, 
a dependable or predictable number of mites when we do the wash, which gets even the mites that are attached on the underside of the abdomen of the bees. So we just need more data to know. But I think there actually is a correlation for that. So who knows? Maybe in the future we don't need a mite wash. Maybe we can do a bee scanning app, which, by the way, it's constantly improving in its identification of the mites, and it's pretty darn good. Because when they send you back the data, and it's immediate, it's while you're out in your bee yard, you took the pictures, uh, you get your feedback within a minute or two, and then you can do close-ups of the pictures. Oh, man, there are mites on there. Look at that. Oh, look at that one, too. And it says it requires treatment. The ones that are clear, it actually has a little note that comes up. This is a great colony that be considered for to be considered for reproduction for expanding your apiary because of its low or zero mite count. So it's interesting stuff, but we need data, and uh, I think it actually could work. We need statistics. We need to keep that going. What are the things I wanted to say about mite washing? Let's see. Oh yeah, when you're taking your bees off to do your mite counts, since we're on the topic, uh, it benefits you to pull your worker bees from the capped brood, even though we know that those would be the ones with fewer mites on them as compared to those who would be on your open brood frame. But what's one important difference? The queen is likely to be somewhere on your open brood frame. So if you're taking your 300 bees, your half a cup of bees off of there, and you're going to do your mite wash with your soap detergent, or if you're going to use alcohol, you're going to kill those bees, then you have to be extremely careful not to capture your queen in that. So you're less likely to mistakenly draw your queen into it if you're collecting off of your capped brood frames. I hope that makes sense. So the other thing is if you find your queen and you can put her in a cage controller, then you're safe, of course, to draw them off of anywhere, assuming you only have one queen in the hive, and that's normally the case. So that's about it. Next question, number five. This comes from Jennifer. Jennifer Vander Leiden, Leiden from Amherst, Massachusetts. My grandfather graduated from Amherst 1929. I have his yearbook. Anyway, word is we're about to get hit with a tropical storm and I have no idea how to secure my hives from tipping over. Should we have extreme wind gusts? Help! Exclamation point. Now I already answered Jennifer on this one uh, because I figured you know, it was imminent. She needed to know right away. So hopefully we already have the ability to strap down our hives and there's a lot of reasons why we do it. Some people, like me even, just put uh, bricks or you know, pavers and things like that on the top, on the cover of the hive, and we let things go like that. The other thing is when we get into winter though, or if I know heavy weather's coming, and we had a storm come through, uh, we had the National Weather Service warning us, wind gusts 70 miles an hour and all that stuff. So shipping straps, that's what I use. I'm gonna put a video link down in the video description here that will show you how I use the shipping straps because shipping straps are an advantage for a lot of reasons. Number one is, of course, we're going to hold your uh, hives down in high winds. We can also anchor them into the ground with those auger-style anchors that screw in, and they have different weight load ratings. Also, your shipping straps have weight load ratings, so all my shipping straps are rated for 1,300 pounds. Uh, and we've had hives that were secured, hives that were not secured, and we had strong wind gusts come through, and none of them moved. So, you can use shipping straps, use the augers into the ground, that's a risk when you go into winter time because when you have the strap going from your auger in the ground up over the hive down in the ground on the other side then in the spring at least where i live we have frost heave so when we have frost heave in the spring that means that depending on how your hives are supported if they're just on blocks and things like that your hive is going to be lifted up by the frost but your anchors are going to be holding it so then you're going to put a real load on your straps so on the flip side of that, I also have iron T posts and things like that as supports which go into the ground, which are not affected by frost heave. And you can also strap specifically to those iron T posts and the metal inch and a half conduit. It's a galvanized conduit that's used for electrical work. That's what I support some of the hives with. And you can strap to those. Nothing is moving those. Now that I said that, something's probably going to happen. But that is a very secure way to strap down your hives. The other thing is, with a lot of rain and flooding and things like that, this is another reason to have something like 
iron T-post, some kind of vertical support that's driven deep below your frost line where you live, and then your horizontal bearing members are strapped to that or bolted to that in some way that can handle the load that you're going to have. And that way, if there's flooding, if you just get a foot of water that cycles through there, uh, this is, of course, barring heavy debris and things like that that might be on the water, but if you've elevated your hives more than 18 inches, which is what I do now for all of my skunks that seem to be athletic for some reason, uh, if you're elevating them off the ground, you're also avoiding some intermediate flooding that might come through your apiary. So apiary placement is very critical when you're brand new and you're starting out. Think about historic flooding. I mean, it might be beautiful to look near uh, the bank of a river or something like that, but that's also where bears may walk. So consider your plot location when you're setting up your beehives and things like that. So strapping down with augers, I know I went into other things there, but... If you have posts that are driven into the ground, you're very stable for your beehives. And then you can strap to the post, to the lateral pieces and things like that. And I did not get feedback from Jennifer on how, you know, she fared the storm. So if you're watching, it would be great to know that everything came through okay for you. And others that had storm events in their yards, in their bee yards. How'd you get through it? How did your bees, uh, how did your hives hold up? And what did you do to prepare for heavy winds, heavy rains? and uh, the combination of all these things going on at once. So some areas that aren't usually impacted. We also have heavy storms coming into our southern coast, the Gulf Coast area. So other uh, beekeepers down there must do something to keep their hives up and out of the way. So I hope you all keep your bees safe. Question number six, moving on. Tom Martin, Olympia, Washington. What factors drive the colony into winter preparation? Temperature, reduced daylight hours, dwindling resources? Or something else. But when it comes to um, that drive the colony into winter preparation, do you know when winter preparation uh, kicks in for honeybees? Spring. So the moment that they're able to fly out and forage and start to bring in resources, the entire time what they're doing is storing the resources for the upcoming winter, even though it's months away. They're also preparing to reproduce. That's what swarms are. That's why when we're fighting the swarms and fighting the tide and trying to keep everything, how do I stop my bees from swarming? How do you stop anything from reproducing naturally? It's a biological function. It's what they're going to do, and it's an uphill climb for us. I've had bees swarm over the past week even. Plenty of room, plenty of everything that you're told to provide for them, and yet they still swarm. They haven't even finished drawing out all their comb. They haven't finished filling all the available resource cells and things like that. They just decided to reproduce and the queen goes out and I catch them and now I rehive them. And that's a whole nother story. But they're frustrating me a little bit because they don't want a whole bunch of beehives right now. But uh, so more specifically, what prepares them to get ready for winter or any dearth period. So winter is a dearth period. Summer provides a dearth period in a lot of areas. And we have these fat-bodied winter bees. These are worker bees that don't forage, that when they're produced, they have extra fat and resources stored in them so that they can actually rear brood in the absence of stored pollen and resources. So they are themselves the resources necessary to produce and care for freshly hatched brood in the middle of winter. Plus, they live much longer than a normal worker. They can live up to six months. So in areas like this where I live, those, uh, the stimulation for those to be, uh, to be produced comes from the nutrition coming through the entrance of the hive. Now I'm sure there could be a, a combination of factors. The days get shorter, the nights get colder, you know, there's less forage time and things like that, but it's really what the environment starts to uh, produce the environment's producing less they're getting less pollen they have so the queens start to cut back on their egg laying because they're cutting back on the consumption rate of resources within the hive as well so the queens respond to food resources coming into the hive that's why commercial beekeepers can artificially stimulate your bees by feeding excessively and they do that on the outside. Some of these uh, commercial beekeepers put out 50 gallon drums of feed to keep things going, to keep the hives booming, to keep their populations up, which is completely the opposite of what I'm doing right here in backyard beekeeping. Because I want my bees, the only bees that get fed are going to be brand new colonies that are small, 
they've been collected as a swarm. Um, I've done a split maybe or something like that and I want to start them off. Although I can look back on this entire year, 2021 in the summer, we made spring splits. I put them in nucleus boxes and I wanted to hold them back intentionally. All I wanted them to do is produce queens. I wanted those queens to fly out, get mated, come back. I wanted that little cluster of bees in there to take care of the queens. And then I would have resources if I needed to bolster any of my other hives. And it completely backfired on me. My ignored colonies, my ignored nucleus colonies, which were all homemade queens right here, just bees from my own hives. You know, really random walk away splits. Looking at a hive, they look strong. Lots of brood, lots of eggs. Oh my gosh, three frames of eggs. I'm going to pull one of those and I'm going to pull a frame of uh, partially capped honey over here. And I'm going to put two in that box, which only holds five frames. And I'm just going to ignore them. And right like clockwork, they all raise their queens. And they have too many bees now. So their populations are exploding. Now, after this nectar flow, we can expect the pollen, the protein that they need to produce their next generation of bees uh, will be in decline. And they'll start to depend on stored resources alone. And that will inspire them, of course, to draw down and make preparations for going into winter. And that is when the winter fat-bodied bees will be produced. That's why we're in a critical time coming into next month. Because the nutritional value of what's coming in to the hives is going to be key. So artificially feeding and artificially stimulating and all that other stuff, I'm thankful not to have to do that for my hives. Because now we can match the rhythm of what's going on in the environment in other parts of this country where they have a summer dearth, it's been discovered through science, which a lot of people seem to really dislike, but scientifically they've proven that even in summer, some queens and some workers produce fat-bodied bees, fat-bodied workers, just as we do going into winter. They'll do that going into a summer dearth, and that allows them to keep a tiny cluster of brood going on through summer in a period where no pollen and almost no nectar is coming in. So they're already, depending on resources, already stored in the hive. So then when you artificially stimulate with your pollen subs and sugar syrups and everything else across the board for your whole apiary, then you don't really know if the bees that you have are adapted to local conditions and local seasonal cycles of dearth and abundance. So I hope that makes sense. So this year, I didn't even feed some of the swarms because even when I put the swarms in their hives, I just wanted them to stay small. I wanted them to stay, I wanted them to survive, but I didn't want them to explode and then have another swarm and have another, you know, it's a whole never ending story there. But uh, so even a lot of the swarms I've not fed. By the way, some of you may be wondering about the storm swarm that we captured. Uh, they're doing fantastic. They're bringing in their own pollen and everything else. You talk about a hive that was neglected. We put in frames that weren't even drawn out or anything. And just let them go. And pollen is just cycling in there. They're just booming. So anyway, I hope that helps kind of define what causes them to go into winter preparations. They're preparing for winter. They're preparing for hard times. Always. Whenever resources are available, that's why there's such a fever pitch when they're out there and the foragers are getting in as quick as they can, storing a thing as fast as they can, and then winter comes and they're prepared for it. Periods of dearth is when it's kind of all over but the crying by then. So, Next is Rick Garnet. Beast navigating in cloudy weather. Don't bees see into the UV wavelength of light? That would mean that even when it's cloudy, when they can still see the UV that transmits directly through water vapor of the clouds, that's why you would still get sunburn. And this is a comment that was posted on my Robbing How Fast Can Honey Bees Rob Honey Resources, and it started raining and it got stormy and we got full cloud cover. And I commented that the bees can no longer navigate by the sun now, but yet they're still navigating through rain and they're making it to their landing boards and everything else. So there were a few people that were confused by that. Hey, Fred, come on, can't they, 
Okay, they still, everybody knows ultraviolet light goes right through the clouds and they can still navigate. Well, this is science-based stuff. Okay, so it is true that with light, stratified clouds and things like that, or if we've got some heavy clouds, but there's a little bit of blue sky that lets the rays of the sun pass through, bees can see that polarized light, that ultraviolet spectrum, and they can navigate by it. But during this particular video where I made these comments, we had total cloud cover. And the comment about, you can still get sunburn. You can get sunburn in 10 feet of water, by the way. Just letting you know if it's clear. So, but here's what happened. Bees actually no longer navigate by the sun and by the ultraviolet rays, which are polarized, which I understand what people are talking about because this has all been studied. This is science. I don't just throw random things out and, and just expect people to buy what I'm selling, kind of. Um, so what happens is when you've got total cloud cover, your bees are no longer navigating by the position of the sun. Big, big surprise, you know, but you need some of the sun's rays to get through strong. It can't just be filtered through rain particles and things like that. And how did they discover that? There were studies, of course, done. And studies have been done. These are not even new. There have been some done, you know, within the last 20 years. But even before that, they understood. And one of the ways that you kind of figure out how are bees doing what they do? I mean, how do we even know? That's a bees, ultraviolet, you know. Well, it's, it's tests and repeatability of tests and evaluations and coming up with experiments that disclose what an animal's capabilities are. So bees and ants, you know, they're related, by the way. Social insects. They can navigate not only by the sun with ultraviolet light and polarizing it so they can see what its source is, but they also navigate by something else, landmarks and the horizon. So now if we were sitting around and we go, well, how do we know that the honeybees are no longer navigating by the sun? How do we know that they're navigating by the horizon instead? Well, we have to conduct experiments that would rob them of the stimulus of one or the other, right? So then we could see if they navigate. So what they did was they took the honeybee foragers and while they're out and about and they made facsimiles of the horizon, the distant horizon, because that's a great fixed feature. The distant horizon would be much more important than something immediate, something at arm's length, because my orientation to that item would not necessarily get me home if the sun disappears on me. While the distant horizon, if I could register the configurations of that, that will help me navigate home. So they took the bees and they completely blocked out their ability to see what's overhead. And they provided them with a synthetic horizon and they found that the bee headed home based on the horizon. Now, likewise, in a heavy overcast situation, they made the bee blind to the existing horizon and provided them only with the cloud cover. What did the bee do then? Were they able to navigate home through heavy cloud cover? No, they were not. So they discovered that bees and ants, by the way, can use the horizon to navigate by. And so by removing or providing one or the other, we come to the conclusion that if the cloud cover is heavy, the bees no longer rely upon the sun, nor can they navigate by the sun during periods of heavy cloud cover. Light cloud cover, yes. Clouds where you get little bits of blue sky through there. Yes, they see that because then the polarizing light streams through in a strong enough way that they can navigate as if it were the sun again. So I hope that satisfies this question that this comes to me uh, through not just one person, but a lot of people uh, thought that it's incorrect that if they have heavy cloud cover that they can no longer navigate because it's ultraviolet spectrum. But these studies have been done, and I'll link studies for those who want to know more about it. But uh, no, when cloud cover gets really dense, really heavy, then the bees can no longer navigate through those polarized ultraviolet rays coming. So I hope that answers that. Question number eight. <clears throat> K. Erasmus, please discuss the effect of forest fire smoke on honeybee behavior and foraging. Typically, smoke is measured in parts per million, and anything over 300 is considered dangerous or highly cautionary for humans. What does this scale mean for bees? Obviously, if the sun is blocked, it reduces radiant energy and thus the ambient temp, 
and shrinks the bees' time to do their business. However, does it prevent the bees from foraging at all? Likewise, are the bees agitated and more likely to vacate, etc. So there are, again, misunderstandings about what bees are doing when they're exposed to smoke. And let's not kid ourselves. The forest fires that we've had have been incredible. And they, they've caused whiteouts, you know, just like a heavy snowstorm. The smoke chokes mammals. And so that's the other thing. Bees are insects. They're not mammals. They can handle things differently than people do. For example, we would need 16% oxygen to survive in a space, right? So bees can handle oxygen levels much lower than that. It's because they don't breathe the way we do. They don't respirate the same as we do. And their requirements for survival are not the same. But what the response of the bees is to the smoke is this is what we described earlier on. They make preparations to seek deep shelter. They really don't make preparations to fly out. If you think about it, when the queen bee is in lay, because these forest fires show up all of a sudden, they don't announce themselves days or weeks ahead. So when a forest fire comes through and all the smoke comes through and starts to affect a backyard apiary, the bees are really all going home and clustering inside the hive. What's their goal? Protect the queen. Can the queen fly out? Can they have a swarm right now and take the queen with them? No, because there wasn't any preparation time. The queen would come out of the hive and plunk on the ground because she's too heavy. She's laying eggs. She's in full production and therefore doesn't have the wing power to fly. So a hive that flies out without a queen, the colony flies out, they're just doomed. They have no reproductive resources with them. There's not a member in that cluster then that could produce eggs once they arrive at another destination. So if they're flying out just to avoid fire, I think rather they cluster inside the hives and if it gets really hot and the fire really does come through that apiary i think they all die in their hives i think they all burn uh, beeswax is super flammable most of them are kept in wooden hives people that keep things in plastic hives like apami hives and polystyrene hives those things not only are they going to burn they're going to melt onto the bees and they're going to produce toxic off-gassing while they're consumed so some of you who are thinking about polystyrene hives or apamay, apamay, however you say it, those plastic hives, and you're in an area where you might get a superheated fire or something like that comes through, those are going to melt. Those are going to combust at a much lower temperature than the wood will. So, and then of course, create toxins in the air. So when plastic polystyrene, when that stuff burns, that black sooty smoke comes off, you have toxic air also. So you're also gonna poison the environment with that stuff. So that's enough of that. But what happens when the smoke comes through, the bees can still fly through the smoke, but again, it uh, puts them in a defensive state where they're trying to survive and they're going to cluster, they can consume their resources and then they're going to try to protect their queen and they're going to get as deep into the hive as they can. Just like if they were in a tree, they would cluster in as tight as they can into that tree and uh, just try to survive it. I would be interested in knowing and hearing from those who had any apiaries that were actually burned by the forest fire. And then when they did kind of a, an autopsy of the entire apiary to see how it was impacted by the fire, what the end result was, you know, what survived, what didn't, what the configurations were, and things like that, because fire is something that a lot of parts of this country are going to see much more of, unfortunately. So that was number eight. Number nine. Question about winterizing the horizontal hive. Once I reduced the frames for winter, I was going to make a rigid insulation divider board. Would you leave B space below the divider for ventilation or push it down tight. So my long legs Roth hive um, has a divider board in it right now that's an inch and a half thick because everything was made out of two by stock. And then I put this copper mesh underneath because to have it vented. And even uh, Dr. Leo Sherishkin that does horizontalhives.com suggests having an open gap at the bottom of that divider board. But uh, with my next iteration, I'm abandoning that. I'm going to have my divider board go all the way to the bottom. And because sometimes the bees seem to pass through that and they, you know, they just get in that space in there and like do nothing. So I can't see, he says, to have that opening so the bees can explore the space and go back into where the main space is for your colony. 
And then uh, they're not surprised, he says, when you move that divider board or partition board or follower board, whatever you want to call it, when you move that and provide more frames, they're not surprised that there's additional space there. So I much prefer to keep my bees contained in whatever hive size I simulate for them because mine's five feet long. If I only have right now 19 deep frames in there and that divider board is the end of it, for all they know, that's a 19 frame, almost the equivalent of a double deep Langstroth hive. So I would recommend, this is me personally, I mean, you could experiment with both, but I would use a divider or follower board that goes all the way to the bottom and closes up the space. There's no need to allow them ventilation into a part of the hive that, you know, they're venting through the bottom. They already have the single entrance that's more than enough ventilation. That's proven to work just fine. Somebody else said uh, I was making a huge mistake by doing a horizontal Langstroth hive that none of those bees will survive. They will die every winter uh, because they can't go vertical as they do with the lay hive, for example. Well, I also know that that's not true. Even though I did lose my uh, colony in my long Langstroth hive last winter, I attributed that to queen loss because there was no evidence of reproduction. They just, they just threw, you know, the bees were just dying out through normal attrition through the year. And, you know, I just didn't have enough to keep it warm and for them to migrate horizontally. We know they will migrate horizontally through horizontal spaces because there are feral colonies that exist for years and years in old structures underneath floor joists that are only two by tens, for example. So it is not true that they will not survive having to go horizontal, that they need to exclusively go vertical. I disagree with that. So, and the reason being that they do survive that way. They do use horizontal spaces. So we'll find out again this year that colony is doing, doing well, and we're going to make sure that there's no queen loss going into the fall. They're very easy to inspect. And then we'll close it up and keep it sized right for the resources that they have going into winters. No reason to leave them with a bunch of extra frames in there when they go into winter. So we'll pull all the frames that are not completely full, and we'll close it down to whatever size it needs to be because I've even had single Langstroth deeps with no super on it make it through winter with late season swarms. So we know that that can work. It's all a balance of consumption and you know what the resources that they have are and how many bees are there and what they need to get through winter and what the weather is that year and how well insulated the hive is and things like that. So yes, Follower board, me personally, that would close it off completely. Dr. Leo wants you to leave an open gap so you don't surprise your bees with a bunch of extra space as you move your board over. So if you had more than one horizontal hive, it would be an opportunity to try both. See what you like. I just don't like finding a bunch of bees in the other side of my partition board. That's where mine comes from. Question number 10 from Harry Herbs from Wisconsin. What's your opinion on feeding of ProSweet over sugar syrup? ProSweet is a, a special blend made by Man Lake of uh, sugar syrup. It has the density of honey. So sugar syrup and pro sweet, if we're comparing the two, we would have to say it would be like the two to one sugar syrup, two parts sugar, one part water, and you have to warm it in order to get that mixed together. And that's what we do when we want the bees to store resources. So pro sweet, there are differences. One pro sweet is considered an inverse sugar, so it's inverted. So what the heck is that? Well, when the bees go out and they visit a flower and it's got nectar, that's going to be sucrose. And then they're going to come back and they metabolize it and they invert the sugar through this metabolization and it becomes glucose and fructose. And so that's considered inverted sugar and that is what is in ProSweet. The other thing is, if we just have sugar syrup, sugar syrup can spoil. So I've got jars on the shelf of Pro Sweet right now because I've been evaluating it since last fall and it does not spoil. Absolutely not. Here it is all these months later and it is exactly the same as it came out. So now there's proprietary, proprietary stuff in Pro Sweet that is supposed to benefit your bees. So the other thing is price it out. Stuff is way expensive. I bought a five gallon bucket of it. Don't remember what I paid, but it was a pile of money. Uh, do the bees, for example, if you provided sugar syrup at the same, you know, two to one, and you provide pro sweet side by side, what would the bees go for? Because people get it in their heads, we're going to save the bees steps by providing them inverse sugar uh, over sucrose, which is the way it comes from the plants. And the bees will know that, they'll go after it, 
these bees over here getting the pro suite would get a more direct uh, access metabolic metabolically uh, with the pro suite and they would convert it to energy quicker than they would the regular sugar but I found that they go for the sugar syrup more than pro suite do your own tests get a little bit of it try it out so but the pro suite as I said is never gonna have mold in it but the sugar syrup certainly will so it has a longer shelf life better use so if you're putting that in some kind of feeders but there again like where I live going into winter we don't feed liquids so that's it cost shelf life inverted sucrose fructose glucose so on see what the bees want put both out see how it goes they do the same thing it's carbohydrate for your bees so that was my last question for the day so i already updated the storm swarm that people are asking about i didn't want to inspect them because we're super heated right here recently so I don't want to get into them and I do landing board checks and they are bringing in lots of pollen. So everybody's doing great. Uh, the other thing is I want to caution everybody to please do mite checks. Um, I gave a presentation to a beekeeping group, my beekeeping group, uh, over the past couple of weeks here. And um, I asked about how many people do mite checks and less than half of the people raised their hand. So people are guessing at you know, the status of their colonies and how many uh, varroa mites might be in there and whether or not there are treatment levels. Some people are going to treat their entire apiary so they don't count anything, they just treat everything. And I think it's valuable for us to know, even if you're going to treat all your bees, it's valuable for us to know which colonies had the lowest mite counts, which colonies had the highest mite counts. And then we know which ones we want to reproduce from. Obviously, the ones that have the lowest mite counts that do the best at the things that we want them to do the best at, including temperament, including, you know, these are bringing in great amounts of pollen and they're, they're producing a lot of brood and everything else. And, and they have low mites. Well, that's a winner right there. Reproduce from them. This one over here is the reason the whole apiary requires treatment. It's got, you know, 14 mites in a count. But if you don't count, you don't know. And if you don't know, we can't record and... and really have a meaningful progression as we go through the years with our bees and especially if we're making our own queens and things like that we definitely want the ones that are prevailing on their own so don't forget because there's a lot of these click the like button down here so that you know that you already saw it and don't forget to submit your questions and uh, visit the description for more links and more information thanks for watching i'm glad you were here and i hope you have a fantastic weekend